I feel like part of part of coaching an individual skill or or teaching an individual skill uh, is number one how to recognize it, and that's what I want to give you guys today. I want to give you guys the um, some catchphrases and some some things that you can look for when your players are shooting a puck. Uh, you know, you can see it's 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 kind of simplistic to see who shoots better than others, who's got that more confidence level, who prepares it quicker, uh, what their hand position is. But I'll let you know um, exactly what you see, so then you can help you can help them to fine tune or enhance what they already have, the good shooters. And then you can you can also introduce and suggest suggest things to the to the other shooters that you feel would need more help than others when it comes to that. So um, I'm going on almost 23 years here in the NHL level, a bunch of years before that. And one of the things uh, one of the things that this theme is about is about um, giving you information uh, to a lot of common issues um, that I see that players have. And when I say common, common means it's not a big mistake. It's just things that that are ha habitual uh, habits that players have. They revert to comfort uh, to ensure that their body uh, feels comfortable. And sometimes that comfort feeling for some players uh, means uh, it means less stability, uh, less balance, less reaction time because they they come out of their posture position. So I just want to start off by by quickly sharing my screen here. Um, I think um, I think one of the things here that a lot of people um, aren't gonna aren't gonna recognize is um, so here's Cooch. Um, one of the things I'm gonna do a back-to-back -back picture here. Well, give me a thumbs up, Benny, if you can see Cooch here. Can you see Cooch on your screen, guys? Okay, thanks a lot, Benny. Appreciate that. So what I just want you to notice something here. He you can see how he's leaning to the inside and he's got his shoulders going forward, his hips are back, but he looks like he's kind of low when he's on a single leg shot release. A lot of times, a lot of common things that players will do is they'll change their posture when they shoot. And in this, this particular player here, he's a, he's a really good shooter. He's got great confidence getting that shot off. Let me show you now what I'm talking about in posture change. And we'll get to that hand technique and the issues that, that we see with that in a minute. But, but you can see the difference in his position here. You can see how he's... His hips are a little bit more forward. I call this position here, this is a neutral position. He's still got his left leg back. And that we talked about that in our previous um, presentations and seminars that that leg goes back. That formation there produces a, a lot of goals. But look at his posture change. You can see from that to that, how he's he's just has a different posture level. So both posture levels here could be effective. But my question would be, obviously, which, which body position would allow him to produce a little bit more power? The one where he's standing up or the one where he's got more lower posture level? And obviously, um, one of my jobs is to ensure that the players stay low. So this is a common thing that players do when they change their body formations is they get in and out of different posture levels. And what that does when they're shooting a puck that can create different results on the power output, the quickness side, how they prepare to shoot, uh, and, and how, they, how they put pucks into certain areas for accuracy. So I think that, um, I think it's, it's also important to understand when you're looking at your players and you see these different posture levels, one of the things that I suggest is trying to get into their power position and even mention it to your skating coaches. Like this player is going up and down in their posture or they change their posture for something they're doing different when they don't need to, which is kind of common for that to happen. So that's, the, that's one thing that a common issue is changing of posture, coming in and out of their, their stance or going up and down and think of, if you coach a U12 team or you coach a U14 team or even a younger team, um, it might not seem like it's much of a difference, but over, over a period of time when, when players are going in and out of their posture and they're thinking about what they need to do and there's stress and pressure going on, that going up and down can create a little bit of fatigue. 
just this unconscious fatigue and then now start to change their mind a little bit. So that's one of the things that, that, um, that I feel could be a common issue in players. Now here's another player. Um, this picture is up here because for me, I also wanted to let all the coaches out there, when you're looking at your players and you're recognizing, and if it's an individual skill you're looking at more specifically to shooting, one of the things that you can hone in on that will allow you to um, recognize a good shot is a player's elbow position from their top hand. I call that top hand a grip hand. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna also address a lot of different things where, where what that hand does, what it gives the puck, where it starts and where it finishes and how effective it can be in those positions and what the common mistakes are. And I'll give you a visual with that. But, but these, these pictures here are, are critical uh, for you guys to, to recognize just that top grip hand elbow position. When it's out like that, then that allows for range of motion, it allows for better control and so on. And in this case here, uh, this particular player, uh, this is a, a body compromise where you can see, you know, you know that the player is going in this direction. You can tell by the right foot how it's going this way, but the puck location or the puck direction is going to be coming towards your screen. So that that right arm, that power arm and power hand, that pushing motion, that dictates somewhat of the accuracy on the shot of where and how you push that, that bottom hand and arm. So this, this particular photo here versus, now here's another comparison. When we go from Cooch um, to Gallagher uh, on his, you can, see, you can see how that posture level has been maintained. Now, if I'm going to be critical in this particular picture, that just to allow you guys to see something, I'm sure you all know that when a player gets into this formation and they've released the puck in motion, a righty would, would consistently, commonly turn to the right. A lefty would turn to the left. They, they would go to the left. So, so in this case here, um, this is a great picture for you to recognize his lead foot or his front foot, I call it the glide foot. You know, your skating coaches when they're working with their teams, or if you're a skating coach, you know, you got a stride leg that pushes, and then you got a glide foot that glides. So, this particular glide foot here, you can see that you can see that it's it's engaged on its inside edge, everybody. So whenever that, whenever any blade or any any part of your blade gets engaged onto an edge then that's when you start the turning process. So, so I would particularly want to work on getting that, that stride leg into a, or sorry, that glide foot into a flat neutral edge situation. So that won't take them into the screen. That won't take them coming into us. That'll take them going to the direction of the shot. So that's another common issue um, that you guys can look for is that front foot. Now, if, if they release, if they release off of their inside foot, it's easy to maintain a flat edge. You can see that that foot's on a flat edge and you can, your upper body can torque as much as it wants in any direction, but always know that it's important to me that you guys realize that your bottom power hand, if you're lefty, it's your left arm and hand. If you're righty, it's your right. That's what directs the puck. That's what starts the accuracy process is the pushing direction of your bottom power hand. In that in that motion there, I'm going to keep going on here um, as as I'm talking. So um, the other thing is is these pictures are for visuals for you guys, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you um, I'm gonna let you see um, how the stick works universally and why it's effective to maintain this high elbow. So these this particular picture here with Kess. You can see how he's got that elevated elbow, and this is prior to the shot release. So look at his body formation. Um, I was always, I was always uh, really adamant about players' alignment, about how their hip position is versus their shoulder position versus their hand position. And in this case here, a lot of times what players will do is, I talked about it last time here a couple weeks ago is when a foot comes off the ice, the, the foot that's off the ice, the knee, that knee tends to go to the outside of the body and not back. Like in this case here, 
Kess's knee is going back. So whenever that knee goes back, it causes the body to go forward. If this is the knee here and it goes back, the body goes forward. If the knee goes outward, then the body goes to the side. It kind of like, it's a counter universal motion that, that, that happens there. So it's imperative that when you see a player lift up a foot to take a shot, that that knee of the foot that comes up, most, most of the time, if you're righty, the left foot comes up. If you're lefty, the right foot comes up. Two things you got to try and explain to your, to your players. Number one is you got to maintain your posture. Because a lot of times when a foot comes up, the posture will come up naturally because of that slippery surface under you. Number two, you want to make sure the knee goes back behind you because when the knee goes back, the shoulders go forward. And people would argue that that this particular player here for many years has been a very, uh, a very strong shooting type of player that would be on the top of his, his scouting report would be his, his good shot. And that's because of his body formations, even when they get compromised, if that makes sense. And then you can see on the other angle here, Cass is coming in. This is a better angle of showing you how the leg is going back. Now me um, on a shot release, depending on the situation, depending on the stress level, uh, where the pressure is coming from and how close it is, um, I, I would like to have that leg down a little bit more. Uh, you don't want it to be up too high. Uh, two reasons why. Number one, um, when your players and teams are at the, uh, the age and level of uh, body contact, um, what happens is if the body gets compromised, if it starts coming out of its posture and a player bumps into another player off of a shot release, uh, then that puts the player in a reactive recovery mode uh, because they need to get their foot down prior to doing anything, number one. And number two, the other, the more, more important reason that you want to have stability after a shot is, uh, is hoping to, to capitalize on any possible rebound, deflected block shot, um, an opportunity to be able to do that. So in this case here, if Kess gets this shot blocked right away, he hits shin pads and before he can really react, he's got to get his foot down. And the closer to the ice that that foot is, uh, the better it is for you. So that, that's another common issue when players shoot is, is their, their posture level, their foot level on the ice, and then having the ability uh, to recover quickly, react quickly. So the closer things are to the ice, the better it is for the player. And uh, I would recommend um, making a note of, of asking your players uh, to maintain stability. I've always said, I'll probably say it again here a couple more times in these, in these visuals is, is the, a shot release to me is having your body uh, in the most stable aligned position before the shot, during the shot and after the shot. But obviously because of the stress levels and pressurizations in the play uh, situation, that can't always happen, but we want to try and get it to um, as much alignment as the best alignment as possible to the target. Kess is a great example of, of an applicator here and, and his, uh, his reputation of hot dogs precedes itself, but, but he's, uh, he's a great, great player and a great guy. Um, going forward here, um, here's, here's one of the compromised body positions that I can give you guys a, a visual on before, again, I appreciate your patience in listening to me uh, talk here, um, just going on and on. Remember, if you have any questions, shoot them off, um, um, or or it's okay to uh, to send me an email anytime. I, I'm okay with that. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But here's a a great example of a player who's torquing his body away from his shot. Now, one of the things that um, that I recognize in this picture here is is this particular player has no issue in creating power, no matter what what position his body's in. And that's one thing to, to, um, uh, to try and recognize with your players. You'll, you'll see that some players are, and I'll use the word a uh, wiry. Some players are wiry. Some players aren't well, when they're, when they're doing power output, uh, some players have the ability to torque and flex differently from others and everybody's different. So in some cases, um, to me, to me, the shot getting off and getting through is the most important thing. But if there's an, an actual recovery or a situation where you have to um, jump on a loose puck or, or even pick up a stray or retrieval situation after a shot, 
Um, this would take a lot of time to capitalize on because of the body position is compromised. And also, um, I got a note here about this picture of, you know, like his body looks like he's traveling in this direction. His, his upper body is going, uh, it's going in opposite to his lower body. That's that torquing. And we're going to talk about torquing the stick uh, with the hand technique in a bit. Uh, but to me, look at his power arm. Like it's the power arm is, is obviously going where the puck has to go. So this is a great example of, um, of the power arm showing the direction of the actual shot location and no matter what the body's doing. But I prefer, I prefer if that body could be going in the direction of the shot, that's better alignment. The hips are there, uh, but who knows uh, in the situation at hand. You know, if there's someone's pressurizing him from the inside, the outside, which is forcing him to get the shot off quickly. Um, I'm unsure of the situation, but this is a great, great visual of the torquing that the body has to do to be successful when you shoot. But that's a common issue that players have is they want to get the shot off quick, no matter what body position they're in, because it's just important that uh, that, that quickness is there. So... It's uh, and you can see the difference from that body position to to that body position versus this body position, uh, you know. And then I guess the common thing with these body positions and hip positions here, uh, as I'm flipping through these pictures, uh, when we get to these pictures, you can see uh, when you get to this particular player here, um, there's a compromise. So it's a great visual to see to see that when when um, when there's so many different options. So here's here's number 34 for the Leafs. This guy, um, this is a great example of, of I'd like to use this visual um, for a way that you could commonly succeed because of the body position, the alignment, and the hand positioning. If this angle, if usually, usually most players when they shoot a puck, everybody, and this is one thing you can do when you're running your drills and you have a basic fundamental shooting warm-up drill going on or any, any for that matter, any shoot-up warm-up drill, um, stand behind your players when they shoot. Stand behind, like have a rear view of when they're releasing. And what that'll do is that rear view will allow you to, to see some of their upper body versus lower body and their angles of their arms. In this case here, I'm going to use my cursor. Um, he's bringing the puck in to take the shot, and you can see his hand goes in front of his body. You can hardly see his hand. His arm's in front. It's close beside. Whenever a player shoots a puck and they bring their arms inward, it's kind of like, bringing, it's kind of like branches on a tree. The closer the branches to the tree trunk, that's where it's most strongest. The further out they are, and a lot of players will reach way out, um, and I'm over-exaggerating, they'll get their arms way out, and the farther out they are, the weaker they are, but they feel like, a lot of players feel like if I overload, if I take it back more, if I take it out more, because I'm getting it back, I'm winding it up so much I can get more power, which is far from the truth. The other thing that is a misconception here on, on this particular shot is, is uh, Matthews' hand positioning, it doesn't change much. This diagram showing the puck way out here it was never out that far. That puck was probably uh, right where the arrow is, right where the arrow is. And then he brought it in, say, six, eight inches to take the shot, to get it through the shot lane here. Uh, I remember this particular play he scored off of this shot. It was really good. Now, the other thing to recognize is, and, and um, I would put the question out there if it was interactive, that what do you notice that's really good about this player's hand position? And It's that elbow. It's that grip hand or the top hand elbow is out and elevated. So that's allowing him to have whatever range of motion he wants when he's doing a pull in, whether it's a drag, whether it's a quick uh, wrist snap combo, or, or if it's just a silent release or if he puts it outward. So that gives him the opportunity to use that range of motion to his best ability. And, and to me, that range of motion, we'll talk about that, uh, in a couple of minutes, that range of motion needs to be minimized as much as possible, but still have the ability to move anywhere you want it to go. So when the hands are close to the body, which is another common issue, having the hands close to the body, when you are watching your players, 
there's some drills you can do uh, to get your hands away from your body. And, and, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you a picture of that uh, going forward here. So that's great. That's great for Matthews there. So the other thing is, this is an example, and this is one of my, my favorite players to dislike because of, uh, of, of just how successful he is with what he can do with his body. Now, this is a stable body, and this is a difference. Um, you know, when you look at, at players that are at the NHL level, and then you look at players that, uh, that are up and down from the NHL, uh, you can see the difference in, in what creates success in their body position and how they succeed with that body position or, or their confidence levels or their work ethic um, mixed with the technical stuff that they work on, on the ice and off the ice. So this picture's in here because sometimes commonly what happens in games, and this is, you know, like using NHL examples uh, to me, uh, one, one coach one time said, hey, Turkey, um, you know, I'm, I'm coaching 10 year old girls and, and, uh, and, you know, like they don't even know NHL players yet. Some of them don't even, they don't even can't even recognize some of the players and, and so on. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. But to me, doesn't matter what the age, the level, the gender, um, they're going to get put into these compromised positions eventually. So giving them a visual of, of what it is, 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 uh, is, is important to me. Um, in the future, in the future, I, I feel like that that using using these examples uh, for just for common whether it's issues or successes is uh, is a lot better than um, than being able to explain verbally or showing showing a younger player. Uh, so so that's one of the reasons why I use the NHL uh, examples here. Now this this is a particular particularly really good visual because uh, Crosby here. You know which way he's going. He's coming into your screen uh, right here, and he's shooting across his body. And and I put this up because usually what players will do is you'll be able to see um, their hand coming into their body. But that full range of motion was was executed here by him really well. And it's a full push with a complete full extension lockout. So his arm is in a complete. It doesn't look like it because of his elbow pad but his arm is in a straight line towards the target, which helps to create power. That's the reason that, that this example is in there, um, a cross body shot. It's important that you, you guys understand that that wide stance, that wide stance that he has there creates that low posture for him. So the wider your feet get apart, and, and I mean, if I'm gonna be critical, um, if you see Cooch in this position here, uh, with that distance between his his glide foot, his right foot, and his stride leg, uh, I mean, I could make a comment that how great it is that that toe is on the ice and that his heels up. That's called lock and lift. He's locking his front his front foot on his flat edge, and he's lifting, locking and lifting. He's lifting his toe up, but keeping it on the ice just in the shot release. In a stride, if he wasn't shooting, that foot wouldn't be on the ice like that. That toe would probably come up about uh i'd say two and a half three centimeters or or maybe two two inches or something or an inch and a half whatever that that would relate to but but in a shot release uh another common question i get when players lift up their foot uh to take their shot uh what happens is that compromises their hip position so that's that, that's really good example of uh, getting a wide stance so if you can get your players when they're shooting to separate their feet as they're getting into that stride formation, uh, then that would be that would be really really good um, to a really good suggestion to get them lower uh, naturally without bending their knees, just getting their legs separated. So that would be a good note. Okay, going forward before we get to the uh, preparation part, here's the alignment stuff. This is I put this up here before. Um, I, I think that um, I think it's important that everybody understands that. Uh, with the alignment part, and again, commonly, before we even get into the upper body stuff, where the hand positions are and how they push and pull and how they operate uh, the stick, um, it's important that you guys know that that to me, good shooting starts with a good foundation, and that foundation to me is all about a player's confidence in their skating. 
I've often said to, to parents and coaches and, and, you know, I'd go in and a, a large percentage of the team, everyone can skate. And I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that they can't skate, but everyone can improve their skating. The players who, who have the ability to turn right, the exact same speed and confidence that they turn left or vice versa, or stop the same way or pivot the same way, back and forth. Like you, you see your players where sometimes you'll say, okay, hit the blue line, everybody pivots to the stance or everybody pivots to the flags or to the queen or, or whatever that way, going that way up and down. And you can see some of the players who have issues just doing a pivot. You know, they're making noise when they, when they pivot or they're, you know, they're going into a stall or they're slowing down and that's common. So to enhance your skating and to get your body into this, aligned position uh, this particular visual here for me is um is really good really good you can see the hip position the distance between the feet the toes just off the ice um, you can see and, and i'm going to talk about I brought this picture up before i stop sharing my screen and then share some other stuff um, that you know the elbow you can't see the elbow but it's right beside his head allowing him to have that range of motion and there's a pulling action there uh, his elbow is going to lock out. You can see there's a stick flex there that tells me in this particular shot release that uh, that this stick flex is correct for the player. He's got more than three inches on that. It's a downward trajectory when he's releasing the puck. Uh, you can see that 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 lockout of the knee is going to make the hip snap forward whenever that knee locks out. So one of the other things is when when players shoot after they've done skating or technical skating you'll see there's enhancement on their shot whether it's uh, quickness uh, power or preparation uh, because they just got that skating fresh in their mind when they lock their knee out everyone when you lock your knee out when the kneecap goes like back or up in there that tells me and should tell you that that they're activating the muscles it takes that are necessary to make that knee lock and we spoke about that initially about a month ago that the the quadricep the hamstring and the glute so the quad the ham and the glute these three muscles um to me those those muscles generate a lot of power when you shoot when you're in that stride formation if you push when you shoot if you're actually boost your momentum like you're taking a skating stride as you're releasing the puck whether you have timing a time delay or you pause or whatever but that muscle activation is so critical. Um, you can, you'll, see, you'll see it happen when the knee locks out, that you'll see the activation of the muscles allowing that to happen. And it's the same thing for the, for the, the power hand and power arm, righties, your right arms, your power arm. Uh, when you activate the bicep, the tricep, the forearm muscles, um, even before the wrists, the wrist snap at the end, uh, that wrist snapping action, that will tell you that they're, they're getting power as long as they lock out and hold that that particular position when they're taking their shots uh, going forward. Uh, I, I mean, the head up here, uh, this is another great example. And, and you can see, I'm going to go back quickly here to Cooch. Uh, I mean, there's no eyes on the puck here. Uh, you know, that, that curvature that he has there will, will constantly, if that puck, if you look at the puck in his blade, uh, if he received a pass in on the heel prior to the release, uh, that pattern that he's using where the pocket is on the blade, and that's important for you guys to look for in players as well, is uh, what curves they're using and how the puck comes off. Is it spinning? Uh, and, and we'll go over that in a minute. But if this puck hits his heel, it's going to naturally, if it's in a straight line to the target, the puck's naturally going to settle into his pocket. If he receives that, that pass closer to the toe, it's naturally going to settle into his pocket area. So when, that, when, when a, a player's curve or their pattern, their actual pattern, if it matches the way they shoot, that allows them to even keep their head up even more because they know the puck's not going anywhere. And that could be, that could be taught through, through passing, pass receiving, through preparation drills, um, through, through different types of shot releases. Um, you can teach the players to do that by suggesting they get their head up like that. And that's one of the things that is common with Cooch. You can see, you can see he's got eyes on the target when he's releasing it. And you know, it's 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 important to me that 
that uh, that coaches understand. You need to have the patience um, when it comes to the shot locations that your your players are doing. I know they're they're probably hitting the glass, and I made a comment about this a couple of weeks ago, where where try not to when it because of these common issues that players have, and one of them is hitting the glass or trying to go bar down all the time, and your players are doing that. Try 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 not to be Try to have, if you can, a little bit more patience by recognizing how the shot came off instead of where it goes, you know. And then if there's an issue on how it came off, then if we can correct it or make a suggestion. Uh, one of the things I did to a team one time, it was, a, I want to say it was a U15 team. Um, I'm going to say a li- like a rep level. So here, here we have A, double A, triple A. And then before A, there's still a rep level just under that. So I want to say this was an A level team. It was a rep level team. And the coach came up to me. He's like, like, just watch the first, the first three minutes of the shooting drill. And he says, I'll bet you a coconut chocolate bar that every shot's going to hit the glass. And I'm like, okay, blow my whistle. The drill starts off. And it's like, holy crap. I was like, he's right. It's just nothing hit the net. So I call the team in and I'm like, okay. I'm like, I have a challenge. And the team's like, okay, what's the challenge? I'm like, well, do you want the challenge or not? And the captain puts up his hands. Hey, I'm going to take the challenge. I'm like, okay. So every shot you take in the rest of this warm-up trail has to be the hardest pass to the goal. So you can suggest to your players that, hey, just shoot it or pass it as hard as you can to the goal. And you'd be surprised the puck doesn't stay on the ice anyways. It still elevates, but not as high as it would normally go, making a little suggestion like that. And that changes their mindset, and it also changes their technique. So that common issue could be uh, an antidote or corrective to that is just challenge your team to do different things just to see if they can make the adjustments. And then if they do, reward them. Reward them if they do that because they can do it. But then you'll have one player. There's always one player out there that either doesn't want to or just, just can't. So going forward, it's important that the starting point of the puck couldn't be more effective and important could be than the actual result result when you're in practice and training situations or you're helping your players to achieve something. That's important to me. Now I wanted to get to, uh, if there's any questions, remember, ask at any time. I'll try and answer if I can. Otherwise send me an email. If you think of something later, anytime, send me an email. So let me just, um, let me just get back to, uh, Okay, so can everybody hear me? Okay, uh, I wanted to I wanted to say thanks for coming. Um, uh, whoever missed the introduction at the beginning, we've we've uh, we've wrapped it up here a little bit. But uh, I wanted to show you a little thing that I've come up with here uh, about preparation and, and what players do naturally when they carry the puck, and a lot of common mistakes um, that players make. Uh, whether they receive a pass, they're carrying a puck for a shot or when they're, pre- when they're preparing to do something with the puck and trying to get it off quick. Um, now, what, what, one, of the things, one of the things I'll show you here is, is I got this, this clock here I got put up here, and, and uh, what, what these two lines are here, and um, I'll get to, um, Joe, I'll get to your question here in a second, but one of the things is these are, these are the player skate blades. Let's say they're the shoulder width apart, they're going in this direction. And what righties do, righties tend to always control the puck uh, between uh, one and two o'clock. Somewhere up there, or sorry, between 12 and one o'clock, my apologies. So somewhere up there, it's kind of like going around in this area back and forth because their stick when it naturally hits the ice as a righty, it hits them right, right in front of their right foot. Lefties, obviously it's opposite. Lefties, it's between 12 and 11. And that puck will go back and forth, either across their body. It'll go in this direction, might go in this direction. And they might do, they might try and spin the puck around or circle, whatever like that. But then what happens is in a game when they're traveling and they receive a pass, uh, whether they're carrying the puck there or not. So lefties have to bring uh, that puck all the way down to nine o'clock or they have to prepare or they think they need to bring it back while they're taking their sh- while they're preparing to take their shot. So they're going forward and it's like, I got to take this puck back because I'm, I need to take a shot now. I need to load it up. So they'll bring it from this position here all the way down to about nine or past nine o'clock. I always recommend 
when a player loads a puck, never take it behind their heels. That means their top grip hand. If that puck goes behind their heels, what will happen is, is that top grip hand as they're taking it back will go across their body like that. And then in a shot, in a shot release, can you guys, can you hear me okay when I'm away from the mic, Benny? So when the shot release, what happens is I've just taken that, that puck to this position and I've taken unnecessary steps to do so while I'm stick handling. And when I release it, my hand normally comes back to the position where it started anyways to take the shot location. So we want to minimize the load and maximize the puck position. So when players, when players are going down the ice, I'll always tell them in, in, in training or in teaching, if you want to prepare to take your shot because you're going forward, don't never take the puck back while you're going forward. A player by the name of Alex Kovalev, if there's a, if you guys are old enough to remember Kobe, he, he, he taught me a lot. He's like, Turkey, I never take the puck in the opposite direction I travel in ever. Unless I change direction, then the puck changes direction. So in this case here, when a player needs to shoot, that common, one of common issue or mistake they make is they take it to go backwards when all they need to do is put it across their body and then put their stick in front of it instead of taking it back. So it's like you're skating into the load instead of loading it across your body, if that makes sense. It's kind of important that you understand um, that when players put it from 12 o'clock to just beside one or in between one and two, it saves so much time to get the shot off instead of taking it back. And usually when that puck goes back, here's what happens. Here's what happens. So the puck's on the front of the blade. To load it up, what players will do, they'll take five steps to shoot. So they'll put their blade in front of the puck, They'll move it back. So look at these, look at these steps. They'll move it back. Then they'll fix it again when it goes back. And then they'll pull it up where it started and then take your shot release. So look at this step. There's step one. There's step two. There's step three to fix it. There's step four and then step five to take the shot. So that's when you when you guys are seeing a player dust a puck or some pre-prepare, over overhandle it but prior to shooting, then that's what it is. That's the five steps you're seeing uh, prior to them releasing a puck. So a couple of correctives there. It's just practice short distance passing, short distance pass received to a shot, whether it's in motion or stationary, and just have the player receive and release. And if it's a, if it's a, an off angle or a reach pass, get them all, don't get them to shoot it from away from their body, get them to reposition their hands to take the shot. That's when you want to take time uh, to, to get a better shot off is to fix it into a power position or a prepared loaded position, if that makes sense. Now, got a question from Joe here. Why is neutral edge important on a glide foot during a shot? Excellent question. Excellent question because think of this, Joe, that glide foot, no matter what direction you're going in, it steers the front part of your body. It's like a rudder on the boat. So if it's on a, if you're taking a shot release and that glide foot, is on a neutral flat edge, you continue to go straight and you can build more momentum and add strength and power and quickness and deception to what you're doing. Once you start to start turning away, that's when you start to, to torque your body as you start to turn one way to shoot the other way, or you're on an outside edge to shoot away from your body. Can we, can we be completely aligned up on every shot in with our hips in between the posts? It can't happen, but we wanna try and get as close to that as possible. So that's a great question. Really good question. Now, one of the things, one of the things I wanted to also show you here, uh, hopefully this will work. I got Brendan Gallagher's, uh, I got his, his stick here off of his, his bobblehead. And I don't know if you can see this here, but, but here's, here's Brendan Gallagher's stick. And to me, well, that's a high line, but that's a lot higher than what he uses. But I wanted to explain before we uh, kind of like, ended this off with a couple of questions or, or um, I, 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 if you can um, and you have any questions, go ahead and ask. But as I said, again, you can ask questions at any time or email me, email me as well. Uh, I'll answer uh, as soon as I can. Now, 
Well, one of the things is um, is is with this particular stick, it's a universal tool. So you know my top hand goes here and my power hand goes somewhere in the middle, depending on what shot I'm taking. Now, what I want you guys to see is how this stick operates. So a lot of times, a lot of common issues that players will have is they'll take this top hand when they're shooting and what they'll do is they'll pull it downward. So when it goes downward, you can see how the stick operates universally. It's going down. So if I take my top hand and pull it down, you can see what happens to the blade. It goes, it goes up. If my top hand goes up, that blade goes down. If I pull my top hand back, the blade goes forward. If I push it, you can see what I'm getting at. It's completely universal when I take that shot. So the best thing to do, number one, when you're teaching your kids um, shooting techniques is number one, get them to elevate the elbow on their grip hand side, because that'll maintain a really, really top hand dominant position, keeping it up there. And when they take their shot, it's a pulling action, but it needs to try, you got to try and get them to pull it straight back. So when it pulls straight back, that'll support the lie of the stick by keeping the hand up. And it'll also allow that puck to be projected quicker when it goes straight back, when that hand pulls, when the hand pulls straight back, you can see in that position, you can see the stick goes forward. And it's important that that happens. Now there's, there's to me, there's a critical, critical situation on the technique of, of how this stick works. And then that's this part right here when a player shoots. What do you think makes the stick do this? The wrists, it's the wrists that make the stick do this. So what happens is when players load the puck back and they go to take their shot, they have a really good grip hand pull. It's pulling straight back. It's not pulling down, you know, pull straight back. But then what happens is their stick ends up facing up into the air instead of the rotation, instead of that rotation going forward. So coming towards you, it's like, the stick would be like this. You can see sometimes you don't have a wrist rotation in that. When the shot takes place, the stick needs to rotate forward. That's what gives the puck its spin. And the quicker that those wrists snap forward, well, not all the way over, but just to there, the quicker that that wrist snap as it's going forward, kind of like that, that allows the puck to spin tighter. If the curve is right for them, it's important that that curve in the puck supports or the curve sorry the curve supports the puck action their wrist action the timing of their shot and that's that to me that action to me when you guys see that action um when when that top hand goes outward so when i put my hand outward to be able to pull straight back and do a wrist rotation that's the range of motion i'm talking about that's the area that that player needs and then a couple weeks ago we also said that 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 full range of motion does not need to be utilized. So if that player has their hands way in front of their body, which is really good, the puck's out front, it's closer to the target, they don't have to pull all the way back to take their shot or all the way to the side. They can just pull it really quickly in a short distance and rotate the wrist. And then what that'll do is that'll speed up the release. That adds a lot more to me, it adds a lot more deception because it's coming off quicker. And, and, and it also utilizes the puck position in a great spot. You don't have to take it back. And that's the one thing that, that I feel players do commonly that it's an issue is they overload and the stick goes across the body. It comes, oops, it comes all the way across their body over here. And then they try and operate it out here. And like we had spoken about, uh, your levers or your extremities are like uh, your arms are like limbs on a tree. The further out things get away from you, you might feel like you're getting power, but you're not because uh, because it's just not close to the core of your body where you can generate more power and strength in that. Now, got a question here. Um, um, got a question from Kevy. So so Kevy. Um, let, let me just go to Changsi first here, guys. I appreciate the question. It says, you mentioned two things to explain posture-wise to kids. The first one was, was the knee behind you on the release. What was the second one? So the second, the second one was the stride release formation, Changsi. Like, uh, Joe, when, you, when, when one leg goes back, so, so when one foot's up, 
when one foot's up, you want to stay low. But, but you can see how my hips go back when my leg goes back. So that stride formation. I'll show you that. I'll show you that picture again here, um, so that you can you can see that, guys. And this is important. We answer these questions. So, so you see that. So Changzi, you see how that leg is going back like that? That when they're taking their shot, that's called a stride formation. So for a lefty, it would be the left leg that goes back when they maintain their posture like that, and that separation between their feet will keep them low. So if you can get them to, if you have an issue with a player, like here's Cooch, uh, here's Cooch in the beginning with a, with a small area between his feet. So that if, if that foot went back farther or his, he reached forward with his right foot, he would drop his posture a little bit, kind of like this player looks like uh, right here. You can see there's more distance between his feet. His chest is a little bit more forward there. So that's the second way uh, to get to get that that postured lower there. If that makes sense, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, we, what do we got here? Uh, Lichty uh, Lichty's asking you to talk about uh, about staying short through the puck, uh, like the runway analogy that we talked about. Yeah, so that's a oh, great question. I, I'm glad you brought that up. So one of the things one of the things that that players do is um, depending on the distance it takes to shoot when we talk about the hand positions. Now, the younger they are, it's okay that they load it to their heels because that puck, what it needs to do, the, if the puck starts on the heel and they have a long way, like like I, the analogy I was talking with Licky about was uh, the puck can be an airplane and the blade can be the runway. So as the player is pushing the puck, uh, the puck's traveling along the runway just before it leaves to, to go. That's when their hands are, are, are not as fast um, as they can generate. They're, they're learning the process of getting spin on the puck. So that distance that they take, the longer distance, the more blade that the puck can travel across. And while it's traveling across the blade, the puck is collecting spin and, and the speed of the shot. Just like an airplane needs to collect speed to be able to elevate. It's the same thing with a puck. But then, but then when that player's particular skill enhances their shot release, their distance that they're pushing. Uh, then we, I talk about like graduating to from an airplane uh, to a fighter jet because a fighter jet doesn't need the whole runway to take off because it's got more thrust and power and quickness right away. So that analogy of a player's hand position and puck position getting minimized a little bit more when they're doing enough practice and they're learning a little bit more that allows the puck to be more positioned towards the middle of the blade or into the, the midway point of where the pocket is in their curve or in their pattern. It can sit in the pocket. If it's not going as fast, like I said, uh, it can it can travel across the blade into the pocket and then out of the pocket. And then there's that wrist snap at the end where, where it creates that skin. And then ultimately you want that player to have uh, like that saying that I said a couple of weeks ago, less load, more explode. And then that's when they that's when they start to to again graduate from an airplane to a, a fighter jet, and then they go to a rocket. And that's those toe patterns that some players use uh, because there's no space they use. They just activate the wrist. There's a little push and pull, and then there's a lot of wrist activation right away on the quick release. Now that doesn't mean that because you can shoot with the toe that you can't use the heel to take a shot. Still, you can't use the midway point of the blade. That's just a, a graduation point, and that's also a variation or a variety of execution on a type of shot you take or a type of pass you make, uh, allowing you to use the whole blade. And the other thing is while we're on it, which is a great question, is uh, a lot of times I work with the front part of the blade because that's where the puck comes off more commonly the most, but that doesn't mean you can't use the back as well. You know, the back of the blade can be a weapon. Uh, backhand shooting, I'll, I'll address in a, in a, in a different presentation because that's a whole complete uh, it's opposite directional thing to do with your hands and in your body preparation and so on. So great question. Hopefully that that answers that question. And then um, uh, Kevin, Kevin's asking here, uh, he's asking, can you give some tips on evaluating player shots uh, when they're working off ice and in the driveway? Oh man, great, great question. One of, one of the things this is, this is one thing, Kevy, right here, man. This is getting players to set their body into positions. Let me see if I can 
maybe I can pull something up here just quickly for that last couple of minutes. So here's here's Gallagher uh, working working on the, uh, the off ice situation where he'll put. I asked him to put a puck in front of him, and you can see how his stick is. You can see his stick is a little bit uh, a little bit away from. It's called white ice shot release. So you can suggest to your players to position, most of the players will position the puck back at their heels here, and then they'll push the puck forward and snap it off. But in this case here, he's just taking that snap right away, right off there. Hopefully you guys can see that without too much of a lag. So that's another way that you can you can do that. And that's a, that's a great thing when they're in their driveway. But when they're stationary, um, they don't have to be on their skates. Uh, I know there's a, uh, there's a misconception with, with uh, when they're on their shoes, their sticks a little bit taller. And, and again, I'll address backhand shooting and stick height and how to adjust stick height versus body growth and stuff like that in another seminar going forward. Um, but I think I think that that you guys uh, get somewhat the some of the common uh, issues that we come across. Uh, but most importantly to me, it boils down to uh, to posture levels. It boils down to uh, to power output versus body control. And the more their body's in control, the more power they can generate and the better they are uh, stable wise to be able to re react to what comes next, uh, which is really good too. Now here, here Jay Pitsky has got a question here. Uh, I coach U10, is curve, kick and flex uh, as important with the younger kids? Uh, you know what, Jay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, yeah. It is. It is like I think of this. Um, one of the things that I say to players all the time when they're very young and starting out, whatever level they're at, they have an aspiration. A, a kid has an aspiration, whether it's to have the most fun possible or get to the NHL or you know the just to play pro hockey. So I'll I'll, I'll ask them. I say, you want to you want to get in the NHL? You want to play pro? Yeah, 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 pro NHL. And I'm like, okay. Well, then you think an NHL player would act like that right now? Act like, act like you're going to be a pro. So the analogy to that is if a pro needs good curve, a good stick flex, a good height, and so does a kid. The kid needs to, so that they can start now to understand how the stick works. Um, to me, the stick height, the flex is important. And uh, I addressed it a little bit technically a couple of weeks ago that, that if I weigh 100 pounds, that doesn't mean I need a 50 flex stick. And the technique and the power output for every 100 pound uh, individual is different. You can have a, a female player who's, who's, uh, who's 80 pounds that can generate more power than a 100 pound boy sometimes. Just depends on, on the technique sometimes and how it's being used. And that would boil down the puck position, um, the player position, or sorry, the, the hand position, uh, what position the player is in, under the situation they're in. So yeah, yeah, great question on that, Jay. It does make a difference for younger kids. And you'll see a younger kid's eye, you'll see them taking shots. They have the ability to elevate the puck as a young player, but it's not spinning. It's kind of flopping or it's got like a wiggle in a spin or it's kind of like flopping off there. To me, that's a sign that, that something needs to, if they can elevate a puck with their stick, something needs to change in their stick or fine, needs to be fine tuned, whether it's the curve, the lie, uh, maybe the flex point or something like that. Uh, but I mean, this is all easier said than done because uh, when, you, when you start talking about stick investment and, and trying things out, uh, that's why I was so grateful and happy that some big, huge hockey places out here in the area that I'm in in Toronto, uh, well, they're not open now, but, or maybe they are because that's essential, isn't it? Isn't it essential for us to have our freaking equipment? But, but some places have a little shooting thing where you can, you can take a test drive on some of these products and try them out, which is uh, which is really good thing to do. But but great question there, really good question on that, guys. The stick flex is super critical uh, when when that uh, when that is uh, when, when the process of the puck is being projected. Really good. Okay, Pafke here. Brandon says with ice usage always a a premium. Are there pre-practice activities players can do? prior to taking the ice and work on shooting all that. Yeah. Great question. So I was doing a, I was doing one of these zoom seminars uh, presentations to uh, 
to uh, Mr. Gallagher's, um, he's got, Brandon Gallagher's dad is, is well known uh, as an off-ice coach, uh, trainer, and, and very popular um, out in the Vancouver, Canada area. And, uh, and he works at, a, at a, an academy, a hockey academy. So I was doing a session and I was having the players, um, without holding a stick, pretending that they were holding a stick, holding their own stick and pretending to shoot. Without, without having a stick in their head. So it's like, it's like, show me how you push down. Get your downward pressure, but, but not over-exaggerating by taking your shot. So I had players standing in front of me doing this action. And, and, and one of the things that, that was common that I wanted to address is sometimes a player will do that, will do this action because they want to put the puck instead of, instead of getting it straight. So I was having them do this like 10 times in a row. And then, and then I would have them switch and face me and do the same thing. And then so now I can see where the elbow that was. So if players were doing this, I'm like, get your elbow up because you got to have more range of motion when you're pulling and fully extend and lock your arm. So, yeah, they can do that. They can do that, those motion patterns. Plus, they can visualize and mindset themselves. It doesn't matter how old they are. You know, if you went to a player and said, hey, just can you do me a favor? I just want you to sit down, be quiet for a minute and think about how many goals you're going to score or how many shots you're going to get or how hard you're going to back check. Just close your eyes and picture yourself going back and stealing the puck off of another player. You know, it's, it's, it's important to help them think about what mindset action can be and how that can help them succeed and help your team succeed as well. Really good question. They can do all kinds of stuff on there. That's one suggestion I, I'd ask players to do is, is phantom shooting. Phantom shooting without a stick and then get their stick and hold their stick and do it. Or try and flex their stick and break it. Like they're taking a shot. Put their stick on the ice or on the ground in front of them, sorry. And then try and just try and flex it and let it snap back into or kick back into its regular position. Do that five times in a row. If it breaks, then they're, got, then they're strong. Then their parents got to buy them another one. I'm just kidding. But, but really, really good questions here. Excellent. I'm going to start wrapping it up here. Guys, um, I really, really appreciate um, you guys listening to me talk and, and banter on a little bit um, here. Hopefully, some of the things I gave you, some of the visuals you saw, address some of the common things that you're recognizing in your players. It's so, it's so grateful. I'm so grateful uh, to have everybody here. Uh, but I'm gonna let, I'm gonna shut her down now. And Benny, thanks for the communication, everybody. I appreciate you coming from all around the world, taking your time to listen to me, and I hope to see you again soon. All right, everybody, see you later. Have a great day, and be well, and keep yours safe.